Well, hello. All right. Today, we're going to explore immune system disorders. This is lecture 12, and you will find the material in chapter 13. Now, what you have to keep in mind as we're looking at all of this is that when we talk about immune system disorders, this could be diminished immune efficiency, or it could be an overactive immune system leading to what we would normally call autoimmunity, where the immune system damages or begins destroying your own tissues. Now, when we look at all of this, a lot of times when we look at primary immune deficiencies, they're caused by genetic defects. So an individual has a gene defect that may interfere with various components of the immune system. So we're going to focus on immunodeficiency first and deal with uh, other aspects of autoimmunity and hypersensitivity afterwards. Now, when we talk about the primary immunodeficiency, the it is an inborn error that affects one or more immune system. If you look at figure 13.1, which I'll show you in a minute, you could have actions that affect the immune humoral system, the cellular system, uh, combined humoral and cellular, as well as uh, immunodeficiencies that act on certain components of the innate immune system. Patients will demonstrate what's called SPUR for an acronym. And that's severe, persistent, uncommon, and reoccurring infections. <clears throat> An example is DeGeorge syndrome. Now, this is a deletion syndrome on a chromosome. It's chromosome 22, and it's a particular marker area of Q11.2. That section is missing. Therefore, the individual has impaired uh, thymus development. As a result of having an impaired thymus development, you have an individual who now has T cell maturation that is deficient or defective. This leads to an inability to mount cellular immune responses. As I mentioned to you before, with primary immunodeficiencies, they could affect B cells or the capacity to make antibodies from those B cells. The cellular immunodeficiencies, now we're talking about T cell responses. It could cause low T cell numbers. It could be because of underdeveloped or absent thymus. And you see a variety of these uh, disorders. It is important to keep in mind that some of these disorders will not be solely uh, focused just on uh, the immune system themselves. Usually what happens is they have a cascading effect onto other uh, physiological systems. You can also have a combined humoral and cellular deficiency. And for example, severe combined immunodeficiency SCID. Wiscott Aldridge syndrome. Now, the innate system can be affected also, and this may be completely a separate situation. Uh, you could have phagocyte defects or deficiencies, and you can have also um, deficiencies in making the complement protein. As you see there listed, C2, C4, and C9. Now, with secondary immune deficiencies, these are usually acquired. They're much more common. The causes include uh, aging or chronic disease. An example includes individuals who have had a splenectomy, the removal of the spleen. And this can be caused also by prescribing drugs, particularly of the classes of anticonvulsants, corticosteroids, or immunosuppressants. Now, there is situations, and everybody can think of pretty much the, the, the one that everybody comes to mind is HIV, where um, immune deficiencies are caused by infectious agents, HIV, because the HIV directly damages some of the mechanisms, some of the cells that are part of 
immune system. But let me give you another one. There was a paper that came out uh, not too long ago where they looked at the effects of a measles infection. And measles, the measles virus, erases the immune memory, which means basically that as the individual recovers from the measles, some of its prior uh, immune memory for, let's say, against other diseases, example, polio or mumps or anything else, is gone. Now, we all know that immune system deficiencies can lead to other diseases, particularly cancer. For example, HIV patients uh, will get Karposky sarcoma. Um, a lot of immunodeficiency patients uh, will get um, what is referred to as opportunistic infections. In other words, these are normally infections that their immune system is capable of fighting off. But as the immune system wanes in its strength and vigor, uh, they now become susceptible. The infections will take hold and start causing damage to various tissues, whether it's the lungs or the integument, the skin, or the digestive system, or brain tissue, or anything else. Here are examples of the immunosuppressive drugs. And usually people don't think about anticonvulsants, but uh, some of these do have an effect in suppressing immune system function. Uh, and that includes phenytonin, uh, carbamazepine, and valproic acid, or valproid. Uh, corticosteroids, a lot of times we use the corticosteroids to treat inflammation disorders uh, like autoimmune disorders and things like that. The problem is you have to balance it out because use of prednisone, methylprednisone, hydrocortisone, the problem there is that you could end up eventually tipping the scales more toward being suppressed immunologically and thereby then sensitive to other disorders, other diseases. And then of course we've got the immunosuppressants now, a lot of times they are used uh, to limit or to blunt any attempt at transplant rejection risk. They may be used in some cases with autoimmune disorders or chronic inflammation disorders. But unfortunately, they can lead to making the individual vulnerable because of a suppressed immune system. And by the way, that photo that you see below there, that is a really interesting one. If you see it's, it's yes, it's an EM, scanning electron micrograph, but they've colorized it. And it's a T cell, uh, T cytotoxic cell, actually attacking cancer cells. Now, when we talk about immunotherapy, this is therapy based on boosting the immune system to fight the cancer or the disease. Uh, what's very common today is the development of monoclonal antibodies, which are used to target cancers. Nivolab is uh, directed against metastatic melanoma. By the way, to help you, if you see anything with MAB at the end of its name, that usually refers to monoclonal antibody. So what the researchers have been able to do is develop antibodies that are specific for a unique antigen on a cancer or other types of disorders, uh, other pathogens and things like that. Now, we're going to start moving into the big area that a lot of people start thinking about when they talk about immune problems, and that is autoimmune disorders. This is usually due to a lack of what's called self-tolerance. In other words, the immune system uh, goes after antigens that happen to be part of the self your own tissues, your own cells. And when, with autoimmunity, this is the immune system that basically is attacking healthy cell tissues. Remember that the thymus is involved with teaching the T cells and reviewing them and sort of like processing them, filtering them, removing those that would have um, binding sites or would be going after antigens that are reflective of self tissues. Autoimmune disorders, these are chronic diseases that develop from damaging self tissue attacks. There are a variety of theories and I'd like you to be aware of them because in some ways they're not completely mutually exclusive and they may be effective 
uh, as more data comes down the road. Uh, for example, the pathogen has antigens that resemble the host factors, and the antibodies fighting the pathogen cross-react with host tissues. Or select pathogens release super antigens. If you remember those from um, the chapter on the uh, basically the innate as well as the adaptive immune system review that. They release super antigens that activate certain T cells against cell factors. So that's theory two. One of the third ones is the cytopathic, that's the da cell damaging effects generated by the pathogen, encourage the host antigen presenting cells to process and present self antigens to T cells. Now that might seem like a lot a lot of complexity there, but what you have to think about is this how do we trick B cells, T cells, whatever, to start going after self if they've already gone through the screening process? Well, these are some of the theories that are in development. When we diagnose immune disorders, uh, there are some common signs. And then there are some that are unique for the target tissue or organ. Let's look at the common signs uh, for a minute. Joint muscle pain, fatigue, organ dysfunction, okay? Rash, low-grade fever. Now, the other signs depend on the target tissue or, or the organ, whether we're talking about the skin, whether we're talking about the kidney, whether we're talking about the lungs or uh, the digestive system. You have to keep that in mind. As a result, that's why it usually requires a battery of tests. No one test uh, gives an absolute positive or negative here. We have to have really a couple of them combining that information to make an assessment and hence a diagnosis. Now, the diagnosis includes trying to locate the tissue or organ-specific antibodies that'll bind to that target tissue. How do we manage it? Well, the key issues to deal with an autoimmune uh, reaction or an autoimmune disorder is A, the suppression of the immune response, and B, the suppression of inflammation. The treatment may include immunosuppressive drugs, replacement therapy. If let's say you're talking about the thyroid, the thyroid is so badly damaged now that you now have to replace what the horm uh, thyroid was making, for example, T3, T4, thyroid hormone or in the case of uh, the beta cells on the pancreas, you have to replace uh, the insulin that was being made by those beta cells and because the immune system has destroyed them. One has to also keep in mind something else. As I mentioned earlier, hinted at it, that the treatment can lead to secondary immunodeficiencies. It depends on the intensity, uh, the strength of the immunosuppressive drugs that are being used. Now this uh, chart here kind of brings together some of the different areas and you really get surprised whether it's the endocrine system or connective tissue, bones, bones, joints, and skin, neuromuscular, the systemic, the blood, the gastrointestinal and pancreatic, the kidneys or the respiratory system, that there is some form of autoimmune disorder that exists out there. Some of them will continue to go through uh, throughout the rest of this chapter, but you know, I don't expect you to memorize everything, so don't lose sleep on this part. But do get uh, a familiarization with some of them because you probably will see them very uh, frequently in your allied health medical nursing training. Also, as I mentioned before, some of the autoimmune disorders with possible infectious agent association. Type 1 diabetes, everybody knows about diabetes, but they don't know what causes these insulin producing cells to die. And the best indication is the immune system. One possible link is a Coxsackie virus, which causes infectious myocarditis, the inflammation of the heart muscle. It may be also doing some attacking on the pancreatic islet cells. Guillain-Barre syndrome, you have peripheral nerves are attacked and the muscle weakness develops, but it's implicated in infectious agents is uh, Campylobacter pylobacter jejuni, which usually causes a bacterial diarrhea, 
It is common when you have certain types of uh, foodborne diseases. Rheumatic heart fever. This one's a little bit more, uh, how can I say it, that there's been more history on. Um, individuals that have a rheumatic heart disease tend to have already had some type of rheumatic fever, perhaps caused by streptococcal pyrogens, okay? And it's believed that this heart inflammation scarring, you don't see it as much anymore because of the presence of antibiotics, which pretty much will knock down the streptococcus pyrogens. So it's very rare in developed countries. You do see it still in developing countries. And then multiple sclerosis. And there's a lot of controversy about this one. Usually when we're talking about this, the immune system starting to destroy the insulating sheath, the myelin sheath that we see on nerves. So remember that the myelin sheathing helps to enhance the speed of action potentials traveling down axons. Okay. Now, there's been over 20 different viral agents proposed. Um, most promising appears to be human hep herpes virus 6 and the Epstein-Barr virus. But no one is 100% sure. Now, by the way, if you're wondering, well, why would they come with that? There are situations where they have looked across the globe when there's been sort of outbreaks of multiple sclerosis. And it's not like, okay, it happens here and there and here and there, but they've actually found uh, what, what they would call clusters from an epidemiological approach. You know, almost as if there is some sort of communicable disease in that grouping. Small villages, certain areas where you would see this happening all within a certain period of time, all indicating a certain type of infection that was communicable, but then no more evidence of that particular virus afterwards. Now, the next thing we're going to start doing is talking about hypersensitivities. They're defined uh, as an inappropriate immune response. Hypersensitivities can be localized or systemic. So you sit there going, huh? Hypersensitivities? Well, think about this. People that have uh, reactions to certain things, systemic allergies, um, you have hemolytic um, disease of the newborn, which we'll get into. You also have situations like serum sickness. And then also the uh, delayed reaction, the delayed hypersensitivity. You probably have seen that. Poison ivy. Or people that have reactions to nickel against their skin, etc. We'll get into some more of this in a bit. But where does all of this come? Well, there seems to be a link between the microbiomes and hypersensitivities. And this is where we get into the concept called the hygiene hypothesis. Now, the hygiene hypothesis sits there and says this. Look, in developed nations, we have autoimmune disorders. In developing nations, you don't see it just don't see it, or not as much. And what they think is, is that in our world where uh, you have ultra clean water combined with food, uh, maybe with some of the food having uh, been raised in situations with antibiotic, antibiotic usage, also we using antibiotics to treat certain diseases so it decreases the uh, biodiversity of the people's natural bi microbiota, this increases the, the risk of development of autoimmune disorders and allergies. Another way to put it is, we were raised with wonderful parents that kept us from eating dirt. It's interesting because there isn't as many uh, cases of autoimmunity for the kids that are raised in farm areas than they are in city. And the farm, you, you've got, you know, dust and, and dander from all sorts of animals, and you've got uh, dirt, you may play in dirt, and all these other situations, and yet you don't have individuals having as much of uh, development of autoimmune disorders or allergies. Like I said, it's a hypothesis. Now, the Gell and Coombs classification system. This was a system that kind of 
was developed that classifies the four different types of hypersensitivity. Hint, hint, you will need to know the different types. So I'm just laying it out to you now. There are four classes. In three of the four, antibodies are key participants in the first three types. The type four, T cells play a key role in number four. That's delayed hypersensitivity, okay? And if you like the mnemonics, you've got um, ACID. Type one would be allergies, A. Type two would be cytotoxic, C. Type three would be immune complex, I. And type four, delayed hypersensitivity. So let's explore each one. And this is a good table if you want a thumbnail sketch to review or to study over, okay? Now, you don't need to memorize every detail, but it's probably going to help you if you're trying to get clear from the fog of so much information about what's a type 1, what's a type 2, what's a type 3, and type 4, and what are examples of each, and that would help you. Now, type 1 hypersensitivities. Uh, allergy and certain forms of asthma are also called type 1 hypersensitivities. Now, by the way, just as a sidebar, I don't use the Roman numerals in here, but type 1, the number 1, I just use the Roman numeral 1. So, same thing. When we talk about an allergen, this is an antigen that triggers IgE production. Okay, that's remember that type of antibody there that you see, particularly with allergies. And henceforth, the IE, IgE production and it leads to an allergy. <coughs> Excuse me. The immune systems fight off the perceived threat that is otherwise harmless. Now think about this. Any of you got cats? Well, I love cats too, but I have terrible allergies. As a matter of fact, if I'm petting those wonderful fur balls within a few minutes, my eyes get watery. I start to sneeze. Uh, I start having uh, nasal congestion, and it just gets to be a terrible feeling. Now, besides allergies, uh, these will also include atopic asthma, which is a an allergy-based asthma, atopic dermatitis. This is also known as atopic eczema or allergy-based eczema. Basically, in these areas of the skin, they will be inflamed and itchy. Now, what happens is you have to have a sensitizing exposure. The first exposure of the allergen that triggers the immune system to produce the IgE antibody. And here you can see some of the cases. Okay. And these are examples of atopic dermatitis, otherwise known as eczema. You can see them on the knee and what looks like, I think, the close up of the hand. Okay. What you see happening is when the allergens come in during the sensitization, the allergens trigger IgE production. So you have the plasma cell, which is an activated B cell, but instead it's going to kick out lots and lots of IgEs. The IgEs bind to the surface of the mast cells or basal cell, basal fields, excuse me, and they're going to cause a release of granules. Now, after this post sensitization, you have the person who has already been sensitized. You have the next exposure of the allergen. And this time it just goes straight right to mast cell. And the mast cell will be releasing pro-inflammatory factors. Okay. Uh, because the allergen will bind to the IgEs that are bound onto that mast cell or the basal fill surfaces. And that's going to trigger a massive degranulation. And that degranulation will really result in the inflammation and uh, the other uh, signs. Now, the IgE antigen interactions, as I mentioned, are going to act on antibody-coated mast cells and basophils. Now, these cells will be activated. They will release the pro-inflammatory factors, which are usually histamine and leukotrienes. And this is coming from the cytoplasmic granules. This is where we get the term degranulation, the release of, uh, from the mast cells and the basophils of cytoplasmic granules, which generate the symptom. <coughs> Excuse me. 
Usually, what they'll try to do is take a blood test to assess the uh, patient's IgE level or their titer, IgE titer, to a particular antigen, and that can help predict the allergy severity. There's also a term I wanted you to get familiarized. It's called allergic rhinitis. That's an allergic response to the allergen marked by nasal inflammation and sinus pressure. So the allergic rhinitis is more a localized response than a systemic wide response. Okay. And here are some of the signs and symptoms of various hypersensitivities at type 1. You see on the right, the mast cell packed with its granules. You see on the left, we've got food and drug allergies. These will, signs will include things like odd taste, feeling in the mouth, itchy, watering red eyes, tingling and itchy throat, sneezing, cough, congestion, things like that. With atopic asthma, you'll see wheezing, chest tightness, shortness of breath, that's a dyspnea as well as cough, okay? Um, with the seasonal allergies, now seasonal can be things like, okay, certain pollen. Uh, I myself um, react to lilac pollen as well as to ragweed pollen. So in these situations, you're going to get the cold-like symptoms, you know, the sneezing, cough, congestion, runny nose, post-nasal drainage or drip. I, I, itchy watery eyes, itchy sinuses, itchy or sore throat, ear congestion. And then with atopic dermatitis, you're going to get this persistent, dry, itchy, scaly skin rash, which is going to cause the epidermis to basically flake off and peel off much quicker. Now, with type 1 hypersensitivities, we are also introduced to anaphylaxis. Now, Localized anaphylaxis is usually the isolated response. It's a localized response that occurs, runny nose. It's confined uh, rash as opposed to a rash all over your body. So that's why they call it confined rash. Watery eyes. The systemic anaphylaxis is a system-wide response to allergic reactions. These are the ones that you might have to have an EpiPen ready. How do we diagnose these allergies? Well, they use blood and skin tests. The blood test, you, you examine for IgE titers. Skin test, this is where you get into this very, uh, a little bit, depending on how it's applied, irritating or slightly painful, but it's mostly a scratch and prick test. And they also call it uh, the interdermal test, patch test. What you do is you have the person's back and you make little cuts or irritations on it, scratches, and add some type of allergen, maybe for horse, dog, cat fur, ragweed pollen. Um, it may be cut grass. It may be all sorts of things. And then what you do is you look at the skin is going to have a reaction to it. And you assess the skin lesion. And you'll end up with, if you do have a positive response to that particular allergen, uh, wheel and flare lesions. Now, the wheel is a raised inflamed area. The flare is kind of flattened, but it's reddish or reddened area. And you can see this in some of the images. So how do we deal? How do we manage with these allergies? Well, first off, you'd sit there and say, well, include, avoid the allergen. Hmm, easier said than done. Uh, some parents I've done, they've talked about everything. They've done removal of the allergen. They clean the house completely of dust, of pollen. And they also look for dust mites and have those removed and, you know, everything. Also, there is a series of drugs. They're called non-steroidal allergy drugs. Basically, they limit the action of inflammation from histamine and leukotrienes. Now, the commercial name is on the left. The chemical name is on the right. This is what typically happens. They call it the trade name and then the chemical name or the active ingredient name. Benadryl is the trade name. Diphenylhydramine is the chemical name. Claritin 
that's the uh, trade name. Loratadine is the chemical name, Allegro trade name. Exophenidine is the chemical name. Now, why do I bring this up? For two reasons. One, um, many people are familiar with one type and they think, well, I go to my store and get my generic and it says it's the same thing as Benadryl. Well, guess what? It is. If they say it's basically the same thing, just look at the ingredients. And if they're the same, I don't know. Let me just pull a number off the top of my head. 100 milligrams per tablet of diphenylhydramine. Guess what? It's the same thing as the tablet of Benadryl. A lot of times, pharmaceutical firms, when they develop a product, they only get, well, now they've moved it up to 20 years. It used to be 15 years of market um, exclusivity for the particular product they develop. But after that, then you see the onset of generics. Okay. And that's what you see when they say, well, it's the same thing as, okay. Now, allergen desensitization. This can work in certain cases. It doesn't always work with other cases. The idea is that you're exposing the patient to smaller and then you build it up to greater and greater amounts of the allergen over time. A lot of times it works very well with insect venom. So in other words, bee stings, hornet stings, wasp things, a little bit of the venom so the person doesn't go into anaphylactic shock, etc. But doesn't work as well with food allergies. And that's a bit of a tricky situation. The purpose is to stimulate the T cells regulatory cells so that they diminish the IgE production. And by the way, this is what you see when you start looking into things like a massive reaction, okay, in that particular area. So this would be the systemic anaphylaxis. And what you see predominantly is respiratory reaction. 70% of the uh, population, as well as 80 to 90% uh, have reactions that involve the skin. So that would be hives, itching, flushing, swelling, things like that. I hope that's helpful. Now, here's the example in the images. And what they do is they mark these off and they prick it with a sterile needle so that the solution gets a little bit into the skin, just enough to start to, to trigger a reaction. And then they look at either the wheel or the flare so they can measure it to get an idea of whether it's no reaction, moderate reaction, severe reaction, could be life-threatening, whatever, okay? This is the concept here on desensitization immunotherapy. If you look about midway in the chart, what's the big thing to do? To stimulate the T regulatory cells. So they will stimulate uh, T helper class one cells. And so instead what you get is more IgGs and you want to have a reduction in IgE. Okay. Usually this can work. Uh, for example, my father was had very bad hay fever, went into the military and they gave him the desensitization shots. And for about 20 plus years, he didn't have any uh, when the onset of spring came, he didn't have any sneezing, any watery eyes. Much later in his life, he started having a little bit of the symptoms. But for many, many years, he was uh, free from hay fever. Now, let's move from there to type 2 hypersensitivities. Now, these involve IgG as well as IgM binding. And what they're binding to is a non-soluble agent, uh, a non-soluble antigen. You want to keep that in mind because type 2 and type 3 differ. Type 2 binds to a non-soluble. Type 3 binds to a soluble antigen. But let me stay with type 2 for now. So they bind on the surface of a cell or extracellular environment. For example, collagen fibers in the connective tissue or some area like that. Now, one mechanism relies on the complement cascade for the activation to lyse the cells. Anyways, the antibodies will recruit leukocytes, in other words, example is natural killer cells, to lyse the tagged 
extracellular substances or cells. Now there's an interesting third route that does not lead to cytolysis, but either cell receptor inactivation or overactivation. What? Yep, there's actually one route where you can either get it full blast or no activity at all. And that's where we're going to get into myasthenia gravis versus Graves disease, but we'll get into that in a few minutes. The best way to understand uh, type 2 hypersensitivities, they're often characterized by cytotoxic reactions. Many of them include blood transfusion reactions and also the SAD disease, hemolytic disease of the newborn, otherwise known as erythroblastosis fetalis. What happens with the complement-dependent cytolysis? You have the antigen on the target cell and the antibodies bind to it. And they bring in complement proteins and you end up with the complement proteins forming basically these membrane attack complexes, the MAX. They basically lead to holes, punching big holes into cells that eventually cause the cell to lyse. Now, of course, complement can also opsonize a target. Basically, it's like setting up a flag saying, available to be consumed by a phagocytotic cell, which you can see there. But complement independent cytolysis is a little bit different. Again, antibodies will bind to a non soluble antigen, usually, they're on a target cell. But then what happens is the antibodies flag in assistance from leukocytes, particularly from the NK class. NK cells will trigger uh, the cell to undergo lysis, and so the cell is destroyed. Now you can get one or two factors that occur with inactivation or overactivation. Myasthenia gravis is again another autoimmune disease. And what happens in this case is that the antibodies bind to the acetylcholine receptor. If you remember, the acetylcholine receptor is absolutely essential for the function of muscle cells. Because what happens is the nerve ending will release uh, amounts of acetylcholine. Now, the acetylcholine is the signal sent across the synapses to cause membrane uh, depolarization that eventually leads to a contraction of the muscle. Excuse me. And so what happens here is with the antibodies binding to those receptors, no activity occurs. The muscles do not contract because nothing can bind to those uh, receptors because they're blocked by the presence of antibodies binding on the receptor. Now, here's another situation, but a little bit different. Let's go to Graves' disease. The antibody binds to the receptor on the thyroid cell, but what it does is it basically creates the condition of stimulation. The thyroid cell, in response, releases a dosage of thyroid hormone. This is where individuals can have a thyroid storm, if necessary, of having too much thyroid hormone produced at the time. Now, cytotoxic reactions, otherwise known as cytolytic reactions, this is really talking about the lysis of the cells. So let's get into it. Where you really see these things occur, a lot of times if you put the wrong type of blood into a patient. Now remember, blood groups are based on carbohydrate antigen chains on the surface of the erythrocyte, the red blood cell. Now, the types we're going to be talking about are type A, B, O, and of course, we can also talk about the RH factor. Keep that in mind with the RH afterwards because we're going to get into HDN and uh, erythroblastosis fetalis in a few minutes. One of the key things, if you remember, is that if you have a particular antigen in you, you can't have antibodies to that antigen, but you can't have related antibodies. So type A blood. You can't have anti-A antibodies. That would be a disaster. You'd be destroying your own blood cells. But you can have anti-B antibodies. Now, here's where we get into why we have transfusion 
tests and compatibility before we put a pint of blood into somebody. Blood transfusion requires that you have a matching of the blood type as closely as possible to prevent a transfusion reaction. In other words, if you're type O negative, they are going to make sure that you have type O blood, but it also is negative to the RH factor. They want to match it as closely as possible. So if you take a look here in this little chart, you see basically the representations. Type O has a particular antigen, and, and these little uh, hexagons are representing sugars, okay, carbohydrates, really. But they are types of sugars. They, they kind of have a chain, and so they are the antigen. Now, the type A antigen and the type B antigen are different. They have different types of carbohydrates on them. Now, what about somebody who's type AB? That means they have both the A antigen and the B antigen on the red blood cell surface, okay? Now, when you have uh, type A, you are going to have antibodies in your system for type B. When you're type B, you're going to have antibodies against type A. If you're type AB, you will not have antibodies against either A or B. What about type O? You can have antibodies against type A and antibodies against type B because neither of the antibodies will interact with the type O carbohydrate antigen. And you can see there's five pints of blood there. Well, they're very careful in how they make sure that the blood typing is correct and that it gets into the right person. When you have a hemolytic transfusion reaction, the immune response to incompatible transfused red blood cells is as follows. The red blood cells lice, and the reactions can kill the patient. The symptoms include fever, chills, lower back pain, constricting chest pain, tachycardia, and reduced blood pressure. Okay? Acute reactions also can include what's called disseminated intravascular coagulation. That's a mouthful, but you can also call it DIC. What it means is that you're going to have the spontaneous uh, occurrence of clotting in different parts of the body. But at the same time, that is going to reduce you, the presence of uh, clotting factors and platelets because you're making clots all over the place. And the liver can't, you know, compensate and build up for the clotting factors as quickly. And so what now happens is this. As DIC progresses, the clotting areas are going to start breaking down, but at the same time, you have the risk of bleeding out in other areas of the body, okay? This is what leads to also the potential for hypotension. One, because the blood volume is being reduced, uh, A, by the clots, but B, by also the hemorrhaging, the micro-hemorrhaging that occurs. And B, you're just losing blood volume, okay? Now, what about kidney failure? Well, if you have a lot of blood cells that are breaking down, you're going to have lots and lots of proteins, cell fragments, and lots of hemoglobin that is big proteins that will jam up uh, the glomeruli, okay, at the nephron site, and that's why you end up with kidney failure. Now, ABO is in, uh, incompatibilities can occur between mother and fetus, resulting in jaundice newborns uh, due to a bilirubin buildup. Now, what happens is this. Um, mother's immune system, some of her uh, antibodies will leak out, get across the placental blood barrier or placental uh, exchange site, and these antibodies will go in and start destroying fetal blood cells. That will lead to the buildup of bilirubin. Now, bilirubin isn't going to be excreted as easily out of the fetus. After you're born, then you can pass it out, however. But what tends to happen is that there's a buildup of some of the bilirubin, and it is very lipid-soluble. 
As a result, it can build up in the infant brain and cause brain damage. This is where you get jaundice babies as soon as they're born. Um, they're put under special lights, which cause the bilirubin molecules that are in the skin to break down. And basically, the, the babies are saved from what was a time where the bile pigments would basically lead to uh, decreased mental function. Now we, we know how to basically take care of this very early after the child is born, after the infant's born. Now, as I mentioned to you before, we deal with blood types and transfusion capability, uh, compatibility. Notice that if you're B positive, that means you're going to have to get B positive blood. But you can also get B negative blood. The fact is you're just lacking the RH factor. You can also get O, but that's less, how can I say it, less attractive. You should try always to have an exact match. So B minus to B minus, et cetera. Um, anyways, there is also, and I'm sure you remember this from anatomy and physiology, there is the universal recipient, such as AB positive. Uh, so they'll have none of the antigens, or excuse me, the antibodies against AB or RH. You also universal donor, which would be O negative. Okay. Now, we dealt with the ABO system. Let's deal with the RH factor. RH factor incompatibility during pregnancy may lead to hemolytic disease of the newborn. Oh, I'm sorry. There was a typo there. It should be HDN. Let me explain to you that in this case, you have to have a prior sensitizing exposure. Now, with HDN, you have to have usually the father that's RH positive, mother's RH negative. Mother's um, IgGs cross the placenta, and they can lead to severe, possibly fatal anemia. Now, this is after the first birth. Usually, a lot of times what happens is you don't get HDN occurring in the first birth. You have it in the second and subsequent births. And this went on for a long time until they were able to develop RHD immunoglobulin, otherwise known by its commercial name, Rogam. Rogam is a serum. It prevents the mother's body from making anti-RH factor antibodies. See, the first pregnancy, mom's never been exposed to RH factor. And so what happens is by the time of the birth, when the baby's blood and the mother's blood are freely mixed together, et cetera, et cetera, at birth, that's when it's just about guaranteed mom's uh, immune system will start to learn to make anti-RH. So the second and the third and the fourth pregnancies all the way through there, mom's immune system will attack the fetal blood supply and you'll end up with a miscarriage or stillbirth. Now, obstetricians will know, okay, if dad's RH positive and mom's RH negative, we can't play around. So they'll start giving Rogam at about 25 weeks and continue for week to week and even a little bit after birth. So that basically this serum, which is really anti-RH antibodies, they're going to basically mop up any RH positive cells that have gotten into the mother's circulation. It prevents an immune development. Okay. It prevents the mother from being sensitized to the RH factor. As you can see here. So the first pregnancy is when you get exposure. The second and, and subsequent uh, pregnancies are when you have the development of anti RH um, antibodies. And any subsequent pregnancy, uh, you're going to have this. This used to be a sad occasion for many people until they had developed Rogan. Type 3, hypersensitivities. Okay. Now, these are characterized by immune complexes depositing in tissues. But keep in mind, again, this is a, similar to type 2, but 
the big difference is that it develops when either the IgG or IgM antibodies bind to soluble targets to make an excessive number of antibody antigen complexes. So as the reactions progress, um, you start getting larger and larger aggregates of antibon antibody antigen complexes are forming, and they can be deposited into the tissues, which will trigger a massive inflammation as the antigen aggregates activate complement cascades. The antibodies involved in type 3 reactions can be part of an autoimmune response or formed as a normal response to foreign antigens. Now, the autoimmune type 3 hypersensitivities you can see on table 13.6. Remember that they have to go into the cells. So what are they doing? Well, antibodies can't go into the cell. No, but they can kill the cells and then go after with SLE, otherwise known as systemic lupus erythematosus. It's going to go after, you're going to have antibodies made against the DNA, the histones, the ribosomes, and the ribonucleoprotein. So really it's stuff that's targeted around the cell in the cell cytoplasm or actually in the nucleus. Rheumatoid arthritis, uh, mainly it's a rheumatoid factor, antibodies, that are going to go after the lining of joints, okay? You're going to have the breakdown of some of the cartilage, some of the protection, and so it's going to cause bone erosion that deforms the joints. Scleroderma, this is mainly against the centromeres and topioisomerases. Remember, these are the enzymes that are involved with DNA replication. Okay, so this is going to attack on connective tissues and all the organs that are affected tend to then lead to things like external manifestations of hardened, thickened, tightened skin. You will get this massive upswing of certain immune uh, components. Sorgen syndrome, again, using the rheumatoid factor you will end up finding you have antibodies to nuclear proteins, okay? And finally, post-streptococcal glomerular nephritis. Didn't think I'd say that, huh? Anyways, this is antibodies that seem to go against streptococci, but they cross-react with some of the proteins in the kidneys. This is one of those considerations or support for that theory of how does one suddenly have a mature immune system, but then it starts going after self tissue. Okay. Now, that was the autoimmune type. What about the non autoimmune type three hypersensitivity? This is where the patient's immune system recognizes a serum or other therapeutic substance as foreign. Usually, this is after three weeks from the initial treatment. The patient is going to start forming antibodies to the substance. This can occur with antivenom serums, you know, snake serum, um, scorpion serum, uh, certain spider bite serums, as well as antibiotics. Okay. And the symptoms usually are rash, fever, achiness in the joints and muscles, headaches, dyspnea, and abdominal pain. And the treatment is usually with anti-inflammatories and antihistamine. By the way, there is a term uh, for a particular type 3 immune reaction to serum, and that is called serum sickness. Okay. Now, and you can see this diagram here of the antibodies formed, bringing in the complement proteins, and then going after tissue. Okay. This may also have other elements contributing, such as cytokines and leukocytes. Now, now we go over type 4 hypersensitivities. As I mentioned to you before, these are mediated by T cells. The T cells are targeted to self-antigens or other harmless substances. This can cause delayed hypersensitivity reactions. In other words, from the time of the exposure, it may be 12 hours or more you're having a slow manifestation of building up. And this is after you've stimulated the antigen exposure. If anybody's ever had uh, poison ivy, 
gee, I went through these, I, I must have went through them the day before, and now I've got these bumps and itches and everything else, and it's really nasty. Well, we'll go into this. There's a couple of disorders you need to be aware of. One of them is Guillain-Barre syndrome. It's a nervous system disorder where the T cells will attack nerves that regulate muscle contractions. This is for the autoimmune type for hypersensitivities. Mind you that I'm going over. There's also non-autoimmune types too. We'll get into that in a minute. Hashimoto thyroiditis is another one. This is where the T cell is mediating an attack on the thyroid. This results in hypothyroidism. You had Graves' disease earlier, and that was pumping up everything, hyperthyroidism. In Hashimoto's, you shut down thyroid uh, hormone production. And what about celiac? Celiac is a gluten allergy. This is exposure to gluten. And you think to yourself, no, what is, no, it's gluten. It's basically a protein that you find in wheat, uh, rye, and barley. Sorry about the typo. It triggers T cells to attack the small intestinal lining, usually about two to three days after exposure. I can give you a couple of other pointers there. There is a, what they kind of call the gold standard test. And they look for uh, antibodies to uh, gluten and to... Uh, uh, type of proteins that you're looking for. Now, you have to understand one, one or two other things about gluten and about all of this. We have a society that, well, a lot of the things that we eat are made of wheat, you know, whether you're talking about noodles or, you know, any other type of pasta, bread, lots of stuff. Uh, rye, barley. Well, if you're a beer drinker, what do they use as one of the main components? Barley. But, to enhance the fluffiness of a lot of different types of baked uh, bakery products, bread even, they enhance it with further gluten. And they look for high gluten content in wheat so that you get the particular fluffiness of you know, pastries and donuts and everything else. And yes, someone who has celiac, Speaking for myself, I miss donuts. But anyways, <laughs> let me explain to you. Um, you will have a blood test if they see the antibodies. To try to confirm this, they will do an upper endoscopic examination. My doctor did this. And basically what they do is they send the endoscope down through the esophagus to the stomach and then through into the small intestine. And instead of seeing all the rich uh, villi and everything else, they refer to it as a crack mud appearance. Everything, all the villi are flattened out. Now, mind you, villi are part of the enhancement of the absorptive surface area of the small intestine. So as a result, you end up with nutritional malabsorption as the result. And the therapies require T cell response suppression uh, reducing inflammation, you usually will use something like a cortic corticosteroid anti-inflammatory drug. With celiac, sometimes it's just a matter of just avoiding all the food that has gluten in it. And sometimes that can be a great, a great distress because you have situations, let's face it, food is part of our society. You take somebody on a date, you don't take them to just the movie, you take them to the dinner. You have all sorts of pastries and all these other wonderful things that we have. We have pizza. We get together for pizza. Um, and then for those that are consuming adult beverages, yes, you can have your beer, your uh, various other uh, fermented beverages that use either wheat or rye or barley, and you end up with having severe reactions as a result. But let's move over from there to talk about the non-immune type 4 hypersensitivities. These are triggered by haptins. Now, remember the haptins, if you remember from A&P2, haptins are really sort of like, almost like saying half an antigen. 
their molecules are too small to trigger the immune response on their own. So haptins usually are bound to something. They can bind to host proteins and thereby they become immunogenic. One example is the tuberculin skin test. Uh, it's also known as the PPD test or the Mantoux test. This is basically taking a purified protein derivative uh, and you inject it into the skin, okay? And what you're doing there is using this test to detect for mycobacterium tuberculosis. It's well used. If you've got to get a TB test, you get a TB test. If you've been exposed, you get another TB test. You know, even though I had one two years ago, yep, you still got to have it. Here's the deal. You're going to have a reaction, but it takes about 48 to 72 hours, and it forms this induration, which is really a localized, hardened, reddened skin inflammation. Okay? If you have been fighting mycobacterium tuberculosis, you have had the bacteria in you, you're going to generate some antibodies, and you're going to have a reaction to this PPD. Okay? Uh, one of the the problems, and the book mentions it, and this is true, I've talked with students who have been from other countries, is that they have developed a TB uh, vaccine, but it's not really advised because it's not 100% effective. But they would have kids line up in the schools and some of the uh, other countries, such as the Caribbean islands and things like that. They'll all get their shot. Now, the problem with this is that later on down the road, it makes it much harder to use a PPD test to detect if the, if the individual has TB bacteria, because they'll always test positive. But that doesn't in, it does not completely confirm whether or not the individual may still be having uh, an infection with mycobacterium tuberculosis. That's why in this country, Nobody gets the vaccination. They get the PPD test. Okay. Now, what about contact dermatitis? This is a reaction to industrial or natural products and includes nickel, chromate, pharmaceutical drugs, poison ivy toxin. That's the pentadecal catechol that we have. Let me explain a few things here. If you've ever had some of the cheap uh, jewelry, rings, and it's kind of shiny. Um, you may have where they've added a cheaper metal that provides some strength, and that's nickel. Okay, that can lead to a reaction. Some people think it's the gold. It's not necessarily the gold. It may be the nickel that was added to the metal. And the skin acids, sweat, etc., causes some leaching of this onto the skin and then they have the dermatitis reaction. Pharmaceutical drugs. Some individuals will have reactions after a period of time receiving some of these medicines. Uh, poison ivy, real easy. Um, I can tell you from my own experience, every time I get into an area that I know there's poison ivy, I have to destroy the stuff in my uh, backyard because... Nine out of 10 times, if it's there, I'm going to get it. And if I get it, it's, I've been sensitized enough that I react very, very uh, intensely with it. Um, if I know I've been exposed, there are some uh, chemical washes that you can use now that try to get the material off. But if it's been within a certain period of time, uh, that I've had it on my skin, I probably will end up having a reaction of contact dermatitis. Here's the interesting situation with the PPD antigen, where the individual gets it just slightly underneath the skin of the forearm. And then they're told to come back after 48 or 72 hours. And what happens is the memory T cells recognize the antigen, release the cytokines that promote the inflammation. You get this induration, this hardened inflammation area there, and that's confirmed that, yes, you do have TB. Please understand that they will then go and confirm with a chest X-ray, okay, to look for tubercles in the respiratory, in respiratory area, particularly in the lungs. But 
that's why it lends to a false positive if you've come from an area where you did get a TB vaccination earlier in life. Now, we get into another area of non-autoimmune type 4 hypersensitivities, and this is transplant rejection and the graft versus host disease. Okay, One of the things that we're familiar with in this time and era is that we can transplant some tissue. Some of it can be easily transplanted because it's not vascularized. And so really, uh, you don't have as much problem, such as corneas. But then the other problem is that you just can't put any old tissue into someone because if the T cytotoxic cells detect that the tissue is foreign, then you're going to have this attack on that tissue. And usually that depends on the matching of the MHC molecules. Those are the major histocompatibility uh, proteins that we saw on cells. And so usually they'll take an individual before they're going to transplant some tissue into another person, and they'll find out what their MHCs are. It's almost like thinking of it like a barcode nowadays, you know, to increase the chances of compatibility and reduce the risk of rejection. When we talk about an autograph that's a transplant from the self, there's no rejection that would occur. An isograph would be a transplant from an identical twin. Because they're genetically identical, there's not going to be a chance of rejection. An allograft, though, is a transplant that's similar to the host, but not perfectly identical. The closer the MHC match, the less chance for rejection. Okay, And then we have xenografts, which is an interspecies transplant. Now, that might sound, sound strange, but at one point in the 60s, etc., they were trying to get animal tissues that could be accepted even just for skin grafts and then what happened is we had the dawn of the genetic age where we were able to genetically engineer uh, some animals particularly pigs with uh, their hearts having less and less of pig antigens and more and more of human antigens so they would be acceptable for transplant into a human being some of it has still not achieved any FDA approval or there is risks believed to be of some uh, hidden uh, porcine uh, retroviruses, etc. So they're not really sure if they can really complete this. Now, transplants from an immune um, privileges site, well, when you have tissues that have a blood to tissue barrier, such as the brain, the uterus, the testicles, they're less likely to be rejected. Okay, so the blood, blood brain barrier helps limit that exposure. The blood testicle barrier tends to do this. There have been successful transplants of the uterus. There have been successful transplants of other tissues but they still have to deal with rejection. Now, transplant rejection and graft versus host, let's clarify that. As I said, the greater probability for a successful transplant is that the MHCs of the host and the donor are identical. When we talk about transplant rejection, the transplant tissue is rejected from the recipient of the transplant. That's when you start having the T cells, et cetera, attacking the tissue directly. The first heart transplant, by the way, uh, was done in 19, I think it was the late 1960s. I want to say 67 or 68. But within only a few days, the poor individual um, passed away because their immune system started to actively attack the heart tissue. Now, the other situation occurs. Oh, wait a minute. Before I do that, I know you're probably thinking, well, how do they do it now? Well, they try to have the MHCs match, but what they also will attempt to do is add immunosuppressant drugs, okay? And what these drugs will do is suppress certain aspects of the immune system such that there's less of an opportunity to cause a rejection. Now, the graft versus host disease, GVHD, the graft attacks the host. 
So the graft is actually attacking the recipient's body. This is usually common for bone marrow transplants because when you talk about the bone marrow, what are you doing? You're bringing in a new immune system, at least from the perspective of the bone marrow, so B cells, etc. And the transplant will detect the new body as foreign and begin to destroy it. Here we have the contact dermatitis uh, situation here. And you can see the reaction here. You have poison ivy lesions here. This is a bubble here. And it's not a fun time. Okay. I've pretty much covered everything I wanted to cover here. I do encourage you to review the visual summary on page 400. To review the chapter overview on page uh, 401. To review the end of chapter questions on 403, 404. Remember that you've got uh, homework and quizzes in mastering microbiology. Peruse the videos in Blackboard for the lecture content. Uh, the next area we're going to uh, explore is vaccines and biotechnology. The biotechnology-based diagnostics and therapeutics are going to be helpful. And when you do the um, online lab for ELISA's, that will help coincide with this. This is all going to be in Chapter 14. So have a great day.